Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the session. I'll give everybody like a couple of minutes to, to make their way in. Um, please feel free to like, say hi in the chat and ask questions, and I will kind of answer a bunch of stuff at the end um, when we kind of come around to it. Let me just try and uh, pop up my screen sharing so you can see uh, what I've got going on here. There we go. Hi, Chris. Hi, Jim. Hi, Rai. Thanks for coming and joining the session. Hi, Ashley. Um, nice to see nice to see all of you over here. Um, this is that like after lunch slump session, right? So everybody's kind of, you know, maybe snoozing a little bit. So hopefully this will kind of be be something interesting to kind of uh, come and come and put back up for the for the afternoon. So I'll give it like maybe one more minute, um, and then I'm gonna uh, get going uh, with the talk. <laughs> oh, Jim, see that's it. You're pumped. You're ready for the session, right? You're gonna you're gonna learn lots. You've got all the adrenaline going from the from the game, and you you're gonna absorb everything I've got to say, right? Um, Okay, excellent. I think I'm going to go ahead um, and get started. But yes, please do throw throw questions in the in the chat, um, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them uh, as we go. So, hi, my name is Jacob Tomlinson. I'm a software engineer at NVIDIA. Um, I've been working at NVIDIA for just over a year now, um, and I really want to do this talk today because uh, I've before joining NVIDIA, I was like, like not a GPU developer. I wasn't writing uh, like code that runs on GPUs. Um, my main focus is on like uh, like large scale systems and scaling out on clouds and HPC systems and that kind of thing. So in the last twelve months, I feel like I've learned quite a lot about GPUs, but I'm still um, a bit of a novice in that space because it's, it doesn't actually come up. It comes up less than you would expect uh, in my day job. So I thought I could kind of be a, an insider novice to, to GPU development um, and kind of show you what I what I have learned uh, in Python. So. Um, I'm going to first off and just quickly uh, frame all of this in the context of the team that I work in. So I work on, on a suite of open source software called Rapids. Um, Rapids is, is a bunch of tools, a bunch of libraries and frameworks. You can find them on GitHub. Um, these tools are designed and targeted primarily at data scientists who are trying to do um, you know, whatever their, their data analysis work is. Um, but are struggling to get their kind of performance in the speed that they, that they really need. So Rapids. Um, tries to take libraries that are that are popular and, and useful, like NumPy and Pandas and Scikit-learn and um, you know things like that, and provide the same API, the same feeling, and the same the same kind of thing in Python, um, but with the kind of back end of that library rewritten uh, to run on the GPU and and to hopefully to hopefully run faster. Um, so I, I'm part of this group. I kind of have a I don't work on on those particular libraries. I, I work on the actual scaling out part of it, which is why I was kind of saying I'm like. I'm like tangential to the to the, the core GPU development, and I'm kind of hoping that that will put me in a nice a nice spot to kind of explain to you uh, how GPUs work. So, the main thing that we're focusing on at the moment in Rapids is ETL, right? This is the extract, transform, load portion of a data science workflow. This is the bit where I've got loads of data. I want to run some machine learning model on it, but I need to do a whole load of manipulation and cleaning and moving and maybe saving it in different file formats and all that kind of stuff, all the kind of crud work that goes with, with that kind of workflow. Um, at the moment, is is primarily executed on a CPU. Um, but we're providing tools that allow you to shift that workload over to the GPU, like you would be with, with machine learning, um, and get some performance benefits uh, out of that. So uh, Rapids is, is just released 0.15. Um, the, the actual group's been going for, for a couple of years now. Um, recently, we put out some benchmarks to just kind of show the, the kind of things you can achieve uh, by moving different workloads over to the GPU. There's some nice benchmarks uh, called TPCXBB, which is just like some industry standard benchmarks um, that folks can run uh, against and, and testing wrappers against that. It's actually come out uh, at the top and, and provide some, some really nice uh, speed up. So we're pleased about that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of stop banging on about that um, now. And we're going to kind of dip into things. So to frame it a little bit more, I primarily work on a library called Dask. Dask is a, a Python library for scaling out um, your computation, either onto multiple CPUs in your machine or multiple machines in a cluster. And so my work is focusing on expanding that uh, to work on GPUs as well. So I kind of think a lot about, I want to run some code somewhere. How do I get it on multiple machines? How do I get it set up in different places? I don't tend to actually care what the code is that's executing. Um, and so being able to switch from CPU to GPU, is it doesn't affect me a huge amount. So I've kind of had to learn some GPU things and, and, and 
um, I'm skilling up in that area, but it's not like my my main area of focus. So I think I've kind of come at this um, in a in a learning process, uh, and I'm, I want to share that that learning process with you. So let's start right at the very very beginning. What are GPUs? Now, if you'd asked me that question ten years ago, uh, you know I would have said, oh, those are those are the things that you use to play video games on PC, right? And those are you know, it's the kind of card that you buy, you install it in your machine, and then your games look really nice, and then you can perform really well. And that's traditionally where GPUs come from. Uh, GPU stands for Graphics Processing Unit, um, and is is typically used for for rendering scenes used in in animation and, and film production and and video games. More recently, over the last few years, um, you know, sometimes. You, it was kind of, for a while anyway, it was synonymous with, with cryptocurrency, but then it's mainly now um, used within the machine learning community. So you hear people um, doing awesome and interesting things with you know, telling whether something's a cat or a dog or doing some awesome um, you know, generation of, of images here. This is, this is from NVIDIA's Gurgan um, paper and, and it's kind of showing the, the image on the left-hand side is just a kind of, very basic paint-like drawing where you kind of color in some sections and a, and a machine learning model is inferencing and working out like a painting that resembles that, that image for you, um, trying to make something look, look photorealistic. And so when you look at these kind of different AI things um, and machine learning, everybody kind of talks about, oh, you use GPUs to train the model, you use GPUs to in do inferencing on the model. Um, but I'm not gonna talk about that kind of side of things uh, today. I kind of want to look at actually the first questions that I had when I came to, to working with GPUs, which is, I'm a software developer, I write code, I want to type some lines of code into my computer, and I want them to run on a GPU. Like, how does that work? How do I get to that point um, where things I write run on GPUs? So what we're going to do uh, in the next 45 minutes, or the next, you know, next bit of time now, is uh, actually look at kind of step by step how things work uh, in, in GPU land. So. Uh, if you've kind of built a PC or looked inside a PC, um, you may recognize these two pictures, right? We've got a CPU on the left-hand side and a GPU on the right-hand side. So the CPU is kind of embedded in the motherboard. It's a, it's a chip that clips in or sometimes soldered on, whereas the GPU more often is like an extra card, right? Something maybe a, the motherboard might even have like an HDMI output. So the, the GPU almost feels like a, a fully optional thing that you're like plugging in. So like, how does this work? How do I, how do I run code here? How do I get things to, to execute here? Um, and the best way I can kind of show that to you and explain that to you is by letting uh, the Mythbusters guys um, show that. So this is from this is from NVIDIA's YouTube channel. I, I recommend you go and go and check out the actual video with all the sound, right? But they've got here a nice little robot, nice little painting robot, and this is basically being a CPU. So this thing is going to paint a picture in the way that a CPU would paint a picture. It's doing one thing at a time. It's shooting individual paintballs, kind of at a target. And it's kind of working through a series of instructions. And this is this is a way that a CPU works. Now, I, I, this is slightly unfair. This is a ten-year-old video, to be fair. But um, you know, CPUs tend to have multiple cores and and things like that these days. But typically, a CPU is working through one thing at a time, and is extremely flexible. Right? That little robot could have done all sorts of different things. It had like an arm, and it could drive around. And like, it's very versatile. It's very flexible. Whereas the GPU is more like this gigantic machine that they're showing off now which is like a super paintball machine. And you can see there's lots and lots of barrels here in the machine. And this is a machine that's been like specifically designed for painting a picture, right? This is kind of the perfect example of a parallel processor in that you've got all these parallel um, tubes here. And I think in a, in a second, they're about to set the machine off and you'll see it painting a picture in the way that a GPU paints a picture. Here we go. There we go, the Mona Lisa, right? So that is the way a GPU works, right? It's a machine that's been specifically designed to do basically the same thing, right? Each one of those tubes is doing the same thing. It is shooting a paintball out, but each of those paintballs is like slightly different. It's got slightly different color paint in. And so the result is you get this big splatter of a whole image painted in one go. Now that machine is obviously gonna be less versatile than um, you know, the, the CPU robot would be. You could probably take the paintball off the CPU robot and put some other attachment on it and make it do something else, right? Whereas the GPU is specifically designed for doing this kind of thing. And that makes sense for video games and movies and rendering and stuff is that because the GPU can do lots of things at the same time in a parallel process, uh, you know, the thing that you want in video games and movies and stuff is like an image, right? A grid of pixels in different colors that have been displayed on a screen. So having a, a processor which can process multiple pixels at the same time and kind of do chunks of them, sometimes, you know, when you draw, when a, a display that you, like the one you're looking at uh, updates, it's kind of getting updated in patches uh, along the screen. 
And so that is what a GPU is, is kind of doing. It's calculating what each one looks like, but it's doing roughly the same calculation over a big area um, in parallel. But that, you know, that's super useful for gaming and it's super useful for, for movies, but also there are loads and loads of applications out there where you want to do the same calculation over similar but not identical points of data in order to calculate like a, an array output of similar but not identical points of data. Um, the best one I can th I can think of to explain is if you're like a large company and you're trying to analyze your customer records, right? Say you're a big supermarket and you have some loyalty card scheme where you know customers swipe their cards every time they make a purchase. You've now got this nice big data set of all the things well, each customer has bought. Um, and so maybe you have a big computer system which wants to do some calculation of, right, these people have bought these things, people who tend to buy these things buy these other things. Like, what do we think this customer will buy in the future? And what vouchers can we send them in the mail um, to make use of? And so that kind of calculation, you want to do thousands or tens of thousands or millions of times for, for your, all of your customers. But they're basically the same calculation. But they're from different starting input, they're from different data going in. Each customer is different than their own data. And so you can use GPUs to do that count calculation. Right? If you're going to do roughly the same thing over and over, um, you can you can do that on a GPU and then get some fantastic performance increases um, by by using that hardware. So I'm going to try and keep this like as as like not. I don't want to dive too deep into like Nvidia's documentation and and all that kind of stuff. But I pulled out this image, which is just kind of showing the internal structural differences between a CPU and a GPU. All right, so the CPU on the left hand side here, it's got some RAM, it's got some caches, and it's got a few cores. Um, and they've all got their own caches, and they're all kind of you know, so each one of those cores is like that robot that was shooting the paintballs. It can do one thing, one thing at a time, um, but it's got like a bunch of, of caches to, to speed it up. And so it's pretty flexible and it can do a lot of different things. And then the GPU on the right hand side is just this big grid of cores. Each one of these cores can do things, but because there's like um, fewer control points, all those cores have to do the same thing effectively. And they have fewer caches and there's, there's fewer um, you know, places to put things. And so you have to kind of have all these cores doing roughly the same thing in lockstep with each other. Um, but you can give it different input data and you can fill each one with, with different information. And the GPU also has its own set of RAM um, compared to the CPU. Um, so that's kind of what I mean by you have this big paintball machine, you can shoot all these paintballs, you've now in a, in a GPU, you've got all these cores, but they all kind of have to work in, in unison um, because of the, the way that they're controlled. So the huge revelation for me, I think, uh, in joining NVIDIA is that using a GPU is like using two computers, right? And and I was kind of, for a long time, I thought, right, I've got a machine, it's got a GPU, how do I make use of this this like secret part of my, my computer? Um, but the, the mental model for me really clicked when I started thinking of it as like a separate thing. And it comes up a lot in the terminology if you read, you know, the NVIDIA documentation or, or you know, other tutorials and things, you'll, you'll see that the computer is referred to as the host and the GPU is referred to as the device, right? And and so you, you have, you know, you talk about host memory, which is the memory on the on the PC, and then you've got device memory, which is the memory on the GPU. Um, but if you imagine you're in a, in a situation where you're sat with a laptop, right? I'm talking to you on, on a laptop at the moment, um, but maybe you have a, another computer, a better computer, a faster computer in the cloud or in a data center or something. And so you want to write some code on your computer, and then you want to get that code to, um, the faster, better computer in order to do, do the actual calculations for you. So, you know, on your on your machine that you're looking at with the keyboard and mouse and the screen, you will write some code. You'll put it somewhere in, in version control and, and whatever. You maybe have some data. Maybe this is the customer data I was talking about before. Um, maybe this is, is something else. That machine has a CPU. That machine has RAM. It does stuff. But maybe they're not as performant as you want them to be. Um, if you want to use another machine, you have to, first of all, log, like connect to it, log into it. So maybe you're going to SSH to it. Maybe you're going to use VNC or remote desktop to get like a, a, you know, a GUI representation of that machine. So you're going to like connect to that machine. And the next thing you're going to want to do is get your code that you've written onto that machine. So maybe you copy it over SCP. Maybe you get clone a repo. Maybe you FTP some files somewhere, right? You want to move stuff from your laptop onto that, that faster machine. Um, and the same with the data, right? You're going to want to push that. Maybe you need to push that into a, a SAN or a NAS or some kind of like network storage, or maybe you, you would actually, you know, SCP or, or FTP the files directly. Whatever you're going to do, right? You're going to start on your machine. You're going to push some stuff onto that computer, code and data. Then you're going to log into that machine, and then you're going to run the code on there. You're going to start the application. You're going to execute whatever it is 
there. That machine's going to do its thing. It's going to run through the code that you've written, and it will put some results somewhere, probably save it back onto the machine. And then in order for you to get the results, you have to like pull those back. Um, it's kind of similar to, to you know viewing a web page as well, right? You've got this web server running, and then you're going to make HTTP requests where you're kind of saying, can I have this thing? And the machine's going to compute it and give it give it back to you. So using a GPU is, is very similar, except this just all happens to be inside your one machine. So you've still got your CPU and your RAM that you kind of, and, and the screen and the keyboard and the mouse and all the things that you interact with, your hard drives and, and whatever. This is where your code lives. This is where your data lives. But then you've got this GPU that is plugged into the motherboard somehow, likely by a, a PCI slot. Um, I won't get into the depths of what that is, but you can just think of that as like another connection to your CPU, like a network cable, right? You plug your computer into the internet uh, and that's kind of plugging you into your computer. With the GPU, it connects into a PCI slot and that's also connecting to the CPU in the, in the same kind of way. But what's the what's the an, um, analogous tooling for actually connecting to it? You can't SSH to that device. It's not running an operating system. You can't, it doesn't have storage. You can't copy files to it. So NVIDIA provides something called CUDA which allows you to, to interact with this device, talk to it, communicate, execute code, move data to it, move data back from it. All of this is kind of encapsulated in CUDA. So what is CUDA? If you type that into Google, you will get something that looks like this, where you see some nice C, C++ code, and then you'll see some nice C, C++ CUDA code, which has got some like language extensions, um, kind of showing you how you can do stuff. And if you're like me, you, the first thing you probably think is, I don't write C or C++. I either haven't in a long time. I haven't needed to for my current job. I never have. Like I personally, I think most of my experience with C++ is working with Arduinos in like my spare time to build random like home automation things. Right? I, I'm not a C C++ programmer, and so the fact that CUDA is limited to C and C++ as, as a language. Um, was a thing that was like, well, that makes the learning curve very steep for me. I don't just need to learn CUDA. I also need to learn the whole language that goes with it and all the, the, uh, the tool chain for actually compiling and building these things. Um, so instead of worrying about the language for a minute, what we're going to look at is talk about for a second is, is what CUDA actually does. So as we said, it, it allows you to construct code that will execute on the GPU. And it provides you some tools to compile your like CUDA C++ into machine code that can execute on, on the CPU. And it gives you kind of extra flourishes to the language to specify this is CPU code, this is GPU code, et cetera. Um, it has functions kind of built in that allow you to move data from the memory on your machine to the memory on your GPU. Um, and the best way I, I like to think of that is, I, I feel like when you get into these, these concepts of having data on your RAM and data on your GPU RAM, it's better to just think about it as variables, right? We're working in code. I have a variable. I'm going to like load some data into a variable in my in my code. Um, what I want to do is like, that variable represents some data in RAM. And I don't want it to anymore. I want that variable to now represent some data on the GPU. So there are some functions you can call in CUDA, which will copy the data from your RAM to the GPU. And you just get like a new variable. You do some kind of assignment. Um, and that variable is just pointing to GPU data. And so it, it, this data we're kind of talking about is just variables. But these variables are often often represent uh, arrays. And we'll come on to all of that in a minute. Um, but it it's, can be confusing, I guess, sometimes when people talk about the differences between system memory and, and GPU memory. Because most of the time, as a developer, you're just used to thinking about variables and data structures um, within your language's paradigm, not necessarily caring about where that lives in hardware and the fact that everything's a pointer and, and all that kind of stuff. So CUDA can copy stuff from RAM to the GPU RAM. It can also compile code and make sure that that code is available in the RAM of the GPU. It can then say to the GPU, please execute this piece of code. Um, and then it copies the data. Uh, you can also copy the data from the GPU memory back to the CPU. So this is the same kind of thing as what we're talking about with using SSH and FTP and whatever. But you're just using these different function calls in the CUDA C++ code. But I don't write C++. I don't really. You know, even though NVIDIA is a super C++ heavy organization, I personally don't have a huge need to because I'm worrying about things at the Dask level and like slightly slightly abstracted from that. And so I work primarily in Python. Um, so let's have a look at what we can do in Python in terms of programming on the GPU. So the first thing I'm going to do uh, for all of these examples is I'm going to install Rapids. Now, I said Rapids is like this collection of 
GPU tools for doing all various things that are part of the data science uh, workflow. The actual Rapids package that you can install is like a meta package that points to all these other all these other libraries, QDF and QML and QGraph and QPy and all these other things that start with CU because they're all part of this like CUDA um, world, this ecosystem. Um, but for this example, I've just installed Rapids to pull them all in. You can install each one individually. Um, one of the like tricky things I think about uh, GPU development in Python is there will be some amount of like low level machine code that's needed in order to actually do stuff, right? We don't want to touch the CUDA code directly ourselves, but somebody has had to at some point. And those somebodies are, you know, my colleagues in Rapids. Um, but it means we need to compile code and we need to get that code to people. Um, and in the Python world, pip just isn't up to it, right? Pip, you can't necessarily pip install these libraries um, because pip just doesn't have the flexibility to be able to provide the right binaries to the right people or whatever. So um, Rapids is, is available via Conda. Uh, Conda is, is a pretty standard staple in, in the data science ecosystem anyway, so it's not, it's not a huge uh, shift for the kind of target audience. But if you're maybe a more pure Python developer that's not so involved in the, in the data science workflow, then pip is probably totally suitable for you. Um, so, you know, moving to Conda is, is going to be a, a thing. Um, with that in mind, we also make Docker images available that's kind of got all this set up so that your default Python environment in that Docker image has all of these libraries and it's, it uses Conda, but you don't really need to care about that. You just, you know, execute the Docker container, you use Python, all the libraries there and, and available. You can build it from source and, and things as well. But there's a, a nice like selector on the Rapids website that lets you pick all the different libraries that you need. Um, but I've just kind of gone with the bog standard. Please install Rapids from the, you know, Rapids NVIDIA, Conda Forge defaults channels, right? These were just upstream repositories in, in Conda. So I've installed this. So I've got all the tooling. Um, and I'm going to work through some examples. But the main library that we're going to spend basically our whole time talking about in this session is a library called Number. A number is a compiler for Python, but it's like a it's a just-in-time compiler for Python. So it's something it's a library you import and use in your Python code, um, and you use it for like compiling functions on the fly. So if you have a function you're going to call a few times, um, it can compile that using LLVM down to bytecode. Now, you shouldn't really care about that, right? We're just going to use number as a proxy here for for getting our code to the GPU because number, as well as supporting like CPU compilation, it also supports GPU compilation. So what we're going to do is we're going to write some kernels in, in number. Now, that's another new word, right, kernel. Kernel is just a, a fancy word for a GPU function. And again, this is another thing that like, took me a while to get my head around. It's like, what's a kernel? We keep talking about kernels. I'm used to talking about the Linux kernel. Is that like a different thing? Um, but when, whenever I'm going to say kernel from now on through the talk, what I'm talking about is a function, just a function, right, Python function. Um, but this is like a GPU specific Python function. And there's a couple of caveats that come with that. One is that you can't actually return from your, your um, kernel. Because, because uh, the way our GPU works, it's going to run this function multiple times in parallel, in one go. Actually, like returning results is impractical, right? You could what you could you do? You could like return an array of results, I guess, from like all of these function calls. But you've got to kind of coordinate and gather and the way that we deal with it is that instead of returning anything from your function, you just change stuff in memory, right? You pass your function a variable, the function runs, it does stuff to the variable that it was passed in, um, and that kind of stays changed in memory, right? These are these are mutable inputs to it to a function, and it can feel a bit weird, right? Like in in very, if I was writing some normal. CPU pure Python code, I would feel like a function changing a thing I'd passed to it was like a weird side effect. But um, in GPU land, this is kind of a necessity that, that comes with the territory of doing parallel processing like this. Um, the other thing that you have to do is you have to specify the thread hierarchy of the kernel. Now this, I'm going to spend a little while unpacking because this is the, like, the hardest part that I found um, to get my head around uh, writing stuff for the GPU. So I'm going to show you a couple more diagrams. These are not the best diagrams. These come straight out of the uh, NVIDIA documentation. They make a lot of sense if you're really diving into, into the CUDA stuff. Um, but basically, on your GPU, right, you've got this, this grid of cores that we kind of talked about before. Each one of those cores can run a thread. Right? This is very similar to on CPU. You can have like multiple threads. You do some parallel processing on the CPU. You might do like some multi-threading or something if you want to write a, a complex application. Um, the GPU has this idea of threads, but it also um, chunks these threads into blocks. 
Um, and the reason this happens is because inside a GPU, right down on the, on the silicon, the GPU is actually comprised of these things called streaming multiprocessors. It doesn't really matter what they are other than they are kind of like individual chunks of GPU that can do things. And they're a pretty standard size. Um, a streaming multiprocessor can tend to handle 512 to 1,024 threads. And those are just kind of standard numbers um, that come up a lot as, you, as you're kind of working with these things. So to abstract all of that away, um, you don't necessarily know how many streaming multiprocessors a GPU has, right? All GPUs, you know, as they're being improved and developed, they come out with different numbers of streaming multiprocessors. Some are faster, some are slower. So to abstract all that away so you don't have to worry about it, you have blocks. So you say, right, I've got this many threads, and I'm going to break those up into blocks so I can kind of represent at a higher level something called a grid, right? A grid is just a, here's all the work that needs to be done. Um, and I've got, you know, 2,000 blocks of work, and each block has 512 threads. And that's like, you know, so the, the 2,000 blocks or whatever times 512 threads is how many total th like threads I'm going to have. It's just a weird chunking thing. This is like the way that I've explained that now, I've probably lost you. And that's totally OK. And I'm really sorry. Like, this is just, I feel like I've gone through this a few times personally. Um, it's just a, a funky thing to get, get your head around. Um, but actually looking at something like this, where you've got on the right-hand side a multi-threaded CUDA program at the top, which is broken up into these blocks of things to be done, um, different GPUs will run those in different ways, and they'll, they'll take a different amount of time. So what might help, actually, is if I if we kind of put this into some context. So instead of talking about threads and blocks and whatever, let's talk about some data, right? We've got a huge spreadsheet, right? That's stored in some sensible way like Parquet, but we've got this huge spreadsheet of all of our customers um, for some product and all of their purchasing history. And we want to work out, you know, what's the average that each customer has spent over the last five years, say something like that. So we've got like a thousand customers or 10,000 customers. In order to do that calculation, we can write a function, which is like, take a customer, look at all the things they've bought, add all of those numbers together, and, and do something with it. Um, I thought I'd turn my notifications off. I am very sorry. Um, anyway, uh, let me try and do that uh, over here. Rookie mistake. OK. Um, yeah, we know we have this many customers we want to work through. We write a function, which is going to do like a very simple bit of logic for a customer. And then in order to turn this into a CUDA, CUDA program, we know, well, I need to execute that function like 2,000 times or whatever. And in, in CPU land, you would just like do a for loop or you would iterate, right? And you would just work through all of the customers and run that function each time. Whereas you can, when you're writing CUDA code, you can kind of break it up and think, well, you know, I've got 10,000 customers. I can do 512 threads, uh, you know, per block. So I need to have, um, you know, 20 blocks roughly to get through all of my customers. So I'm going to write my function. I'm going to break it up into these um, these different things. I'm going to say I want 512 threads and 20 blocks, and that will get me through everybody. I'll actually end up with a bit of wastage. I'll have some spare CPU time left. But that's like another thing that comes with GPU programming is you don't necessarily fully fill um, the, the kind of uh, space. Uh, what did I call it in this last slide? Um, the, the thread hierarchy. You don't always necessarily utilize fully the, the thread hierarchy. So the last thing to take into consideration is another new word called a warp, right? And this is another one that's difficult to explain. And I, I'm going to explain it. And I apologize if I lose you. I don't fully, you know, I, I don't feel 100% comfortable with all of these concepts myself. But it, as long as you kind of have some rules of thumb, it's okay. But a warp is the number of things uh, a core, like a streaming multiprocessor in your GPU, can do at one time. Um, and so when I said uh, a streaming multiprocessor can handle 512 threads, this is kind of similar to how like a hyper-threading CPU can handle multiple threads. It's actually like flip-flopping between two things very quickly um, to pretend to be more logical cores than you actually have. Streaming multiprocessors do the same thing. So actually, a warp is 32 threads. And so if your if your GPU says it can do fit, you know 512 threads um, per streaming multiprocessor, it actually means given the 32 actual logical components to it, it can like flip between 512 very, very fast um, in the same way hyperthreading works. So all that really matters after all of that kind of rambling is whatever numbers you choose for threads per block and blocks per grid, they should be a multiple of 32. And a good start point is somewhere between 128 and 512 for your thread count. Um, 
but really you need to benchmark these things because every every function you write is going to be slightly different and, and it's going to come out with slightly different answers. So let's actually have a look at some code and, and do some things. So first off, we're going to from number import CUDA. This is like a utility library that number provides that gives you all the CUDA C++ stuff, but in Python land. It's kind of wrapped everything, abstracted everything. So you can just work with this nice CUDA library from number. We're also going to import NumPy because we're going to use the, those arrays. So the first thing we're going to do is, uh, you know, I said when you call this, this kernel, this, this GPU function, we're going to give it a variable, and then we're going to get it to like populate some the variable with stuff. Um, and then afterwards, we can have a look at what that variable is. Well, because we're going to be running this multiple times, that variable actually needs to represent uh, an array. Um, so here, I'm going to create three variables using NumPy, um, an absolute position, a thread position, and a block position variable. Um, and each one of these uh, is 8 by 8. I know these are smaller than the numbers I just said, but it was what would fit on my screen, and I thought this would be more helpful to show you. So um, these, these 8 by 8 grids that I've made are just full of zeros at the moment. But what we're going to do uh, next is we're going to write a kernel. So this is uh, a CUDA kernel. This is literally just a Python function, right? I've done def my kernel, given it three uh, inputs from my three arrays, and I'm going to do some stuff to them. But the important thing here is I've decorated that function with CUDA.jit. So what I'm basically saying is, number CUDA, please can you just in time compile this? When I run my Python code, can you compile this and do the right things for me? Um, so number will handle all of that. Um, so all I need to do to write GPU functions is decorate them with, with CUDA.jit. And then also like think about how I'm going to run them. So what I'm going to do here is explore the kind of differences in, in the way this, this multi-threading works. And the one like really useful thing um, that I didn't realize initially is you've got all these functions that are all being run at the same time, but each core in your graphics card knows which core it is. And you can access those through these, these um, methods and attributes here, CUDA.grid, CUDA.thread ID, CUDA.block ID. These can actually be constructed in multiple dimensions to like make other stuff easier, but we're just going to play around with one dimensional stuff at the moment. Um, but so we get this absolute position, which is like in my grid of, of cores, which let's just use this as, as our representation, right? I'm going to use 64 cores in a square like this. So we can use the array to represent that. Like the top left core is core zero, and the bottom right core is core 64. And those cores know that. And so we can use that to make decisions about what we're going to do with our code. So here in my little function, I'm just going to grab the different IDs. I'm going to get the absolute position, and then I'm going to grab the XY position, which in this case is going to be the thread block position. Um, and all I'm going to do is take those arrays and update those arrays with the numbers. So like thread zero. Uh, core zero is going to like update and say, well, I'm absolute position zero, I'm the thread position zero, and I'm block position zero, um, and, and so on. So we'll have a look at that in a second. The last thing we need to do is actually configure it. Like I said, we need to tell our kernel what its configuration is. So here I'm just saying I want eight threads uh, per block and eight blocks per grid. My like grid is my whole workflow. Um, and so I'm going to configure my function. And what I'm going to do is instead of calling the function, I'm going to like call it with square brackets, a bit like accessing a, an attribute of it. I'm going to call my function with square brackets, and I'm going to pass it the blocks and threads. Now I get back from that like a new kernel, a new function. But this one has been correctly configured to run on the GPU. So all we have to do is call it like a normal, normal function in Python. I can just call my configured kernel. I'm going to pass it my three arrays. Um, and if we inspect one of those arrays afterwards, we can see that all these values have been filled in from like this single function call where each function call is just updating one point because i executed 64 threads uh in in a in a you know or i i executed eight threads in eight blocks to give me 64 total executions you can see i've like populated my array with those those absolute ids so you know number 30 there uh, knows that it was thread 30. When it was executed, it accessed that attribute. And it was like, oh, I'm number 30. What should I do? Oh, I should put number 30 in this box. And the, uh, you know, another one executing exactly the same time was like, oh, I'm number 49. What should I do? I should put number 49 in this other box over here. Um, and so that is what I mean when I said before, you're running basically the same code, but that code can make different decisions. The only thing to bear in mind here is that um, when you execute a function like this, it will block your like CPU, your 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 Python program, until everything is done. So if you have like some weird code path where you're like, you know, if 
you are number six, sleep for 20 minutes. The whole GPU is going to sleep for 20 minutes because that one thread is, is asleep. Um, so you kind of have to make sure that everything's roughly going to take the same amount of time of execution, um, but they can all kind of do different things and go off. And you know, if you're this number, do this one. And if you're this number, do this one. And um, quite often, the way that shakes out is if you're this number, go and read this number from this array and then do a thing to it. Um, and so if you have like an image and you're trying to do something to it, then you can, you know, each function call will read in like a different pixel from the image and then do like the same processing. If you want to like blur it or something, you know, you can say read in that pixel and the pixels around it and then, you know, mean the values and update it. So you're kind of um, executing over that. Uh, we can also see here my thread and block position. So you can see at uh, the left hand side, each one of those knows that it was, oh, I'm th on thread zero, I'm on thread one, I'm on thread two and so forth in the block position um, going down. So let's just have a look at this example kernel again. Um, you know, we're, we're pulling in wh who am I, where am I, and then we are updating, oh, I'm this one, I want to update this point uh, in, my, in my array. But one important thing I said at the beginning is you have to move data to the GPU and move it back again. And the way that we've just run things here, I didn't do that, right? I made some NumPy arrays. Those are on the CPU. I did some stuff to them on the GPU, and they're, they're still on the CPU. And like, how did that work? So if you... If you don't tell what, uh, number what to do, it will just make decisions for you. If you call a CUDA kernel um, with a CPU array, it'll go, OK, well, I'll copy that. We'll do the thing, and I'll copy it back. Um, and that's great. That's really helpful. It means I don't have to worry about it. But also, what if I want to do multiple things to that array? What if I want to run multiple functions? I don't want it to like copy it, do a thing, copy it back, and then copy it and do a thing, and then copy it back. And we're going to go back and forth and back and forth. We're going to waste loads of time just copying stuff over and over. So you can also be very explicit. So what we could do here instead is we could create our absolute position array, but then say, can we have a new variable called GPU absolute position? And can you copy this array to the device? Um, so I now have two arrays, absolute position, which is on the CPU, and GPU absolute position, which is on the GPU. Now, if I, you know, this is like a, a simplified version of that function, which is just going to update the absolute array. Um, and this is like a simplified way of calling as well. I'm like configuring it and calling it at the same time um, instead of breaking out like I did before. But if I do this and I'm passing it the GPU absolute position, uh, it's going to operate on that array. But CUDA knows, uh, uh, number CUDA, apologies, knows that, oh, this is already on the GPU. I don't need to copy it. I won't bother copying it back. So if we actually uh, look at that GPU thing and try and look at what the value is, it just goes, you know, this is a pointer to a thing on a GPU. What, you know, what do you what do you want to do? So you can then say, oh, okay, I want to copy to host. So we've still got our absolute position array on the host full of zeros, and we're just going to copy back over the top of it from from the GPU. Um, so we'll copy that back, and then we can have a look, and we, we can see the same the same outputs there. Um, there are also like that was that was my kind of intro to GPU code for you to kind of understand, right? You can write normal Python functions. You can copy data to the GPU. You can copy it back again. You can run all these kind of things. You can do whatever you want. But the whole point of Rapids and the community that I'm part of um, is to build open source tools that you don't really have to worry too much about these things. You still have to think a little bit about the paradigm, but you don't have to worry too much. And so in order to do that, we're building higher level APIs that abstract a lot of this stuff away for you. So what I use quite frequently is called QPy. This is exactly the same API as NumPy. Um, but everything runs on the GPU for QPy and on the CPU for NumPy. So you can see here, um, if we uh, import NumPy and import QPy and generate the same array, right, at a, a thousand cube array, um, there's eight gigabytes in memory. Um, one is on the CPU, one is on the GPU. And if I try and do like, uh, you know, some linear algebra, um, it's going to take 139 milliseconds uh, for the CPU to do that operation, but it only takes uh, 679 microseconds for the GPU to do it because that operation can be parallelized or those cores can work together. Um, but the code is the same. The point that I want to highlight here is the code is exactly the same. I'm actually using NumPy in both times um, because of some, some niceness uh, within, within NumPy. Uh, so NumPy will actually go, oh, you've given me a GPU array. I guess QPy should probably actually do this work. And it, it handles that for you, which is nice. But the, the, the point is that the API is the, is the same. Um, Rapids has a bunch of libraries that, that also do this. So we have one called QDF, which follows the same API as Pandas. If you use Pandas, this is like a data frame, tabular data manipulation uh, library in Python. Um, 
And so we can do the same kind of stuff, right? We can generate ourselves like a big data frame in pandas, um, and we can make a copy of that onto the GPU. So we've now got like a pandas data frame and a QDF data frame. And then we can do like an expensive operation like a merge, right? And this is like a very big operation that needs to be done. It takes nearly a minute to do this on the CPU, but this is a very parallelizable operation. And so it only takes half a second to do this uh, on the GPU. Um, so Rapids has got like a whole bunch of libraries. If you care about graph analytics, then you can use QGraph. And if you want to do machine learning stuff, um, you can use QML. Or if you want to do some deep learning, then you can use existing libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow. Um, and all of these are kind of pulled under the Rapids banner um, in the hope that like the main thing that we care about in Rapids is giving people APIs that they're familiar with, but they're also working on interoperability between all of these libraries. So as I said, one of the big pain points here is copying stuff, copying stuff from your CPU to the GPU, doing something to it, copying it back and back and forth. So like, what if I want to load some data, mess with it in CuPy or something for a little while, and then switch to PyTorch and do some deep learning on it? Like how, you know, generally what I would have to do in the past is load it to my CPU memory, copy it to the GPU, do some manipulations, copy it back to the CPU. So I've kind of got the structure back on the CPU and then copy it back to PyTorch or whatever. But a bunch of work has gone in, especially on something called CUDA array interface, which allows you to kind of pass pointers and variables and like flip them between different formats because the array on the GPU is the same, right, in memory. So in this little example here, at the top, I'm going to make a, a 100 by 100 NumPy array. It's a NumPy array. And they're going to use a number to copy it to the GPU to make it like a number array. And if I do a type on that, I get this like number device ND array. Um, but then I can do as array and just give it the number array. And this thing will look at it and go, oh, this is a pointer to a thing on a GPU. I know what that is. I know what structure this is. I'm going to create a new variable that is a coupi array, but I'm just going to point to the same bit of memory on the GPU because I know what this structure is. And the CUDA array interface is like a hidden function on, on in these libraries that allows that communication to happen. So I could then in coupi call dot get, which is coupi's way of pulling data back to the CPU. And we get the same NumPy array back again. So we can kind of pass things onto the GPU, transform them around so you can use whatever Python libraries you like and whatever you're comfortable with, um, do some manipulation, and then and then get it back onto the there again. So that's it. I'm, I'm kind of basically out of time. I'm going to very quickly recap what I went through. So. GPUs run the same function, right? These are just functions. It feels a bit magic at first when you start talking about kernels and things, but a kernel is just a function in GPU terminology. And it's just the same function gets executed many, many times. But the core difference there, and the thing that makes it, it versatile is that each execution of the function gets a unique ID and it knows what the ID is. And then you can change the logic and you can change the code to flow differently depending on what the ID of, of that function call is. Um, Typically, you use, you use C++ to write CUDA code, but other high-level languages like Python have got really rich ecosystems for writing this kind of stuff now. So you've got libraries like Number that abstract away the C++ code, um, do some compiling and transpiling for you, and allow you to write stuff in a high-level language that you're maybe more comfortable in. Um, memory must be copied between the CPU and GPU, and you do have to take a bit of time to care about you know, how much RAM am I using? GPUs don't necessarily spill RAM in the same way that a CPU will page to disk and things. So you have to worry a bit. And that's something that you kind of have to have in the back of your head, but you can work at this higher level in, in something like Python. And often tools like Number will try and help you uh, do this. Um, and the main thing that the community is working on at the moment is to try and bring as many familiar APIs in the Python ecosystem, uh, GPU acceleration, so that folks don't have to have a huge amount of learning curve. You just kind of have to think, well, you know, where is my data? How am I operating on it? But you don't think, how do I operate on it? Because you know the APIs, you know the calls that you need to make. Um, that's it from me. Thank you very much. I really hope this was uh, useful. I'm more than happy to take uh, questions in the chat. Um, also, you can come and find me on the TechExter Slack. You can find me on Twitter at underscore Jacob Tomlinson. I'm more than happy to like chat and answer any questions uh, in any of these places. But uh, that's it from me. I'll kind of keep an eye on things. Um, but thank you very much. And I, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. OK, so we've got a com uh, question here. Do you have any tips about debugging CUDA kernels or pitfalls to avoid that you've learned? So memory is like a big pitfall. It's like a big thing. Like just in preparing this talk, I was constructing um, one of those arrays. It was just those 8 by 8 arrays. But I think I constructed it that many times um, that I, uh, I ended up running out of memory on my GPU. My GPU, as 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 you can imagine, has got quite a lot of memory, um, the ones that I that I have access to. So um, 
yeah, memory management is is hard on the GPU compared to how it is on the CPU. Because if you make something too big on the CPU, things tend to fail a little more gracefully or it'll page to disk. Um, there are tools that we're working on. There's a, a library that's part of Rapids called RMM, which is like a, a memory pool allocator, a bit like you get on the CPU with page tables. Um, so that's, that's kind of interesting to look at. Debugging is, is hard, right? Um, so as you can imagine, I'm writing a function. I'm going to call it 64 times. I can't put a breakpoint. On, on one of those and get one of those to like drop out and stop and tell me I'm kind of sending stuff to another device. And that is that is tricky. So quite often you end up having maybe a variable um, that you want to fill with with log data, right? And so if you want things to happen, you kind of need to maybe append stuff to an array or, or update stuff in array so you can kind of see, oh, thread number whatever has, done, has kind of logged this message for me. And you kind of have to handle that yourself a little bit. Um, there are some low level debugging tools um, and they're primarily targeted at the, the C++ users. Um, they do work with the Python stuff, but it's it's. I haven't personally like hooked it all up. Um, I tend to just have like an array in memory that I might chuck some information into if I need to get like log messages out or anything like that. I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, any more questions? Happy to take them. Uh, so Tom asks, everything in this area always seems to be Python. Is there an underlying reason for that? So I think, I mean, Python is snowballing quite a bit in, in quite a few different uh, areas. Um, and I think it's kind of one of those things. It's a pretty easy language to learn. It's a pretty easy language to pick up. Um, I, I, I mostly think it was just like a first movers advantage kind of thing. I think a lot of folks that were getting into this area started doing it in Python, and it's just kind of picking up. Uh, more and more more steam. Um, like a lot of the code that's written as part of Rapids is C++ with Python bindings. There's no reason bindings for other languages can't be written. Um, it's just that the the community is asking for Python, and so we are we are building Python for people. Um, maybe it's like an education thing. Maybe it's a thing coming out of universities. Um, but it's it's definitely very a very strong desire to have a lot of this stuff uh, in Python. Um, so Jim says, what are the use cases? Uh, what use cases do you routinely see? So uh, I'm just trying to think about kind of stuff that we, we publicize quite a lot in Rapids. A lot of folks that we work with are like banks and supermarkets and, and stuff like that. So if you have a look on the Rapids blog, there's kind of posts that we've co-authored with Walmart, with Capital One and, and things. These are people that are trying to do things like, you know, calculate, uh, you know, uh, a customer's th different values, different properties about a customer. Um, so often you use like the, the ETL workflow, the Rapids workflow to kind of um, build up a, a do, to do like hyperparameter tuning and that kind of thing, right? You're going to build up attributes about people by munging the data and manipulating it and, and stuff. And then you're going to kind of get some parameters and then you're going to train it with a model so you can predict, you know, oh, this person, you know, do you think this kind of person will default on a loan or, or whatever that kind of thing is. So anything where you're processing very large amounts of data, um, especially like big data that happens on like grids, like so I don't know where the data is, is a big one. Um, obviously, I, I come from the Met Office historically, there's um, loads of application in, in that kind of uh, area. Uh, so Jim also asked, are you aware of any serverless environments where GPUs are available? I'm afraid, no, I'm not. Um, this is like a huge thing that I would like to see. Like I feel like my one of my main roles at NVIDIA and in Rapids is taking things like this that like people who love CUDA and love writing GPU code are doing and figure out like how do we get that into the hands of, of other developers? How do we get developers actually using things? Um, so I do a lot of work with Dask where um, we're scaling out to different clouds. But quite often, if you want GPUs, you need to use bare VMs or you need to use Kubernetes with GPU support or you need to use, like on AWS, you can use ECS. Um, some of the things that are like batch workflow type systems. So there's like uh, there is batch on AWS. Um, there's uh, data proc on Google. There's Azure Machine Learning. All of these tools and all of these clouds have GPU things that are kind of you don't have to worry about the the servers, right? Because they're kind of a, it's a managed service. Um, but there's nothing like Lambda or Cloud Functions or anything like that which has access to GPUs, which would be awesome to see. I, d I don't see any reason why we couldn't have that. It's just that the people aren't asking for it and there isn't a demand for it, and we're just it's just time, I think. But we're going in in that direction. Uh, so Owen asks, what are the best uh, resources and places that I know for learning GPU programming? Well, like NVIDIA has tons and tons of, of documentation on the developer site. It's very targeted at, at C++ folks, but there's, there's lots and lots of it. Um, 
Rapids, keep an eye on Rapids and the Rapids blog. There's like a ton of stuff. Quite often we're, we're more showing like use cases and like, oh, here's something someone, here's something interesting someone's done. There's usually example code, there's usually Git repositories. Um, and often these examples are in Python. And so it's kind of more of a, a learn by doing and understanding what other people other people are doing. Um, but other than that, it is it is an immature area and, and we definitely want to like build up uh, more stuff. There's some good courses on, you know, Udemy and, and places like that. but. Um, I, I don't have any particular examples that I that I can offer other than like Nvidia and Rapids, really. Okay, well that's great. Well, if uh, if there aren't any more questions that are going to pop up in the chat, please do like give me a nudge directly on here um, or ask me on Twitter. Um, I'm going to drop off from the from the session now. Um, but thank you all for coming. It's, uh, I've really enjoyed doing this today. Um, and yes, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>